Did you know the story of Jesus who loves you? Jesus who died for you? Jesus can save you. Did you know that he's the one son of the one God? Son of the living God? Jesus can save you. Jesus all day, Jesus every day, Jesus when I go to bed, Jesus when I wake, I want to live a life so I hear him say, well done my child, enter in. Well greetings everyone and welcome once again to International Gospel Hour, our television broadcast, we're blessed to come to you. We are on a number of different uh, broadcasting places, radio, over the air, internet, podcast work, and right here on television. We're grateful to come to you. If you are one of our newer viewers, you are tuning in and you're new recently to our broadcast, we appreciate you choosing to study with us. If you are new and you've just tuned in today, you will find that our broadcast will not ask for your money. We want to study the Bible with you. We want you to use this period of study to draw you closer to God, and we pray we can give you direction toward that end. We have three segments, a highlight segment where we highlight various works within Churches of Christ. We have a Search the Scripture segment, and today we'll be in Galatians 3. And then a Handling the Word of Truth segment as we look in John 20 at the time of the resurrection of Christ and how there were those that reacted so that we can get a handle on the truth and do the same. Once again, we're glad you're with us. And now, let's go to our Highlights segment. Once again, we welcome back our friends at Apologetics Press, and especially today, her newly appointed director, Eric Lyons. Now, we've had Eric on before. He always does a great job with his work, and we appreciate Eric and his diligent work, as well as all of the staff at Apologetics Press. Their work is a great work. They write, they speak, concerning God's existence, the inspiration of the Bible, the creation, evolution, controversy, other pertinent topics. We'd like for you to check out their website at apologeticspress.org. Subscribe to their free newsletter at apologeticspress.org slash subscribe. It's right there on your screen, and you can go to their website and subscribe to their free newsletter that comes out weekly. Now, before we go to Eric, I'd like to bring Genesis 1, 24, and 25 to our attention as we think about God's wonderful creation. The Bible says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Let's talk further about the good things God created, and let's look at one of those wonderful creatures that indeed is a good creation. Here is our friend from Apologet Express, Eric Lyons. Not many animals have a name as fun to say as hippopotamus. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas sounds a lot more entertaining than I want a dog, a goat, or a cat for Christmas. The name hippopotamus means river horse, but of course they aren't horses. Hippopotamus comes from two Greek words, potamus meaning river, and hippos meaning horse, the order of which makes you wonder why the animal's not called potamus hippo. For whatever reason, The name hippopotamus stuck, and hippos have captivated people for thousands of years, and for good reasons. For one, hippos simply have a cute and funny look about them, kind of like a silly-looking pot-bellied pig, but tons bigger, literally. We may not normally think of huge, nearly hairless animals as cute, but hippos look like thousands of pounds of hilarious, lovable, huggable chubbiness. Their long, barrel-shaped, massive pot bellies are carried about on short, stubby legs. 
The largest hippos can reach lengths of 16 feet, weigh more than 9,000 pounds, and grow over 5 feet tall. With such big, blubbery bodies and short legs, you might not think hippos could run very fast, but in reality, they can move it. Hippos can trot on their stumpy legs at 18 miles per hour over short distances. When angry, they can reach even higher speeds, outrunning most humans. Hippos love the water. As long as lakes and rivers are around, that's where they spend most of their time. But they don't actually swim. They can't even float. They sink down into the water, trot along the bottom, and push back up for air. Sounds fun. Amazingly, hippos often sleep underwater. But how do they breathe? According to scientists, hippos are equipped with a subconscious reflex which causes them to automatically push themselves up to the surface for air at least every five minutes. Have you ever done a cannonball in a pool or a river and not held your nose? I don't recommend it. That shot of water up your nose can sting, take your breath away, and make you cough. And sometimes you can get excess water in one or both ears, which can cause discomfort infection and can make your hearing kind of muffled. Hippos don't concern themselves with getting water up their nostrils or in their ears. They have the ability to shut their nostrils and press their ears against their heads when going underwater in order to keep out most all of the water. What little water that might seep in, they quickly and forcefully expel from their nostrils and vigorously wiggle out of their ears upon resurfacing. Don't let a hippo's seeming adorableness deceive you. This animal is actually one of the most dangerous creatures on the planet. It's not that they're hungry, hungry hippos. They're just very territorial, especially in the water. Every year in Africa, hundreds of people who dare to get too close to these dangerous animals wind up losing their lives. Truly, one of the last places you would ever want to find yourself is in the jaws of a hippo. Though they are herbivores, that doesn't stop them from using their massive mouths and foot-long teeth to chomp down on nearly any animal or human that enters their territory, including crocodiles. A hippo's bite has been measured at 1,800 pounds per square inch. A hippo can open its mouth 150 degrees wide and then bite down with literal bone-crushing force. Neither lions nor crocodiles are any match for the jaws of this creature. If you lived in the blistering heat of East Africa and were out in the sun for very long, you would likely need a lot of sunscreen to moisturize and protect your skin. You would also want to take along some antibiotics, such as neosporins, so that if your skin cracks or you get a cut, you can properly treat your wound. Washing a wound in the dirty water in which hippos live would only worsen things. What do hairless hippos, at least mostly hairless, do to survive the hot African climate when they can't find much water? How does their bare skin not crack, peel, blister, bleed, and become infected during intense sun exposure? And when they do find water, how do any flesh wounds, perhaps from fighting another hippo, not get infected in bacteria-infested waters? Amazingly, these creatures have their very own built-in moisturizing antiseptic skin ointment factories. We're not talking about merely sweating salty water, which is cool enough and literally cools us off. Hippos produce and secrete a thick, oily fluid from special glands in their skin. The fluid is not mere sweat, neither is it blood, even though some used to think so since it turns red and then brown on the skin of hippos. It appears the ointment acts as a sunscreen, protecting hippos from harmful ultraviolet rays. Even more impressive is that the fluid functions as an automatic skin ointment. The neosporin-like fluid helps kill any harmful bacteria on the skin. It even protects the skin from becoming waterlogged when a hippo is in the water. If evolution is true, how did a hippo, or the alleged ancestor of the hippo, ever go from being unable to produce such a phenomenal fluid to making it? Does an animal just will such a thing to happen? Could you if you wanted to produce your own neosporin? Do you really think our descendants could? The idea that hippos evolved this unique ability or any other doesn't make good sense. Design like that found in the hippo logically demands an amazing designer. 
Did you know almost half of the global population has a smartphone? At the touch of a finger, you can access the International Gospel Hour by downloading our app absolutely free. You'll have access to our website, social media, podcast option, our YouTube channel, and other resources, all by the touch of your finger in the palm of your hand. Please download our app on your smartphone device today. It's absolutely free from International Gospel Hour. Well, thank you, Daniel. And thanks once again to our friend and brother, Eric Lyons of Apologetics Press. We are underway with some good material. Let's keep it going. And now our Search the Scriptures segment. We have been studying Galatians chapter 3, and today we're going to pick up with verses 23 through 25. The Search the Scriptures segment is simply we go verse by verse and study the Word of God together. It's a great way to grow in our knowledge of God's Word. And now, Galatians 3, 23 through 25. Please feel free to follow along in your Bible, or you can watch right there on the screen. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, as covered in our previous broadcast, faith has come. The faith that is revealed, the gospel, the teaching of the New Testament, the law of Moses brought us to Christ. So let's continue as we study this text. You notice the word tutor. The old King James Version says the law was our schoolmaster. The definition of this word is one who is legally appointed for the care of the person and property of a minor, a watchful care over youngsters, restraining them from falling into evil and seeing that they received instruction. Another term for this schoolmaster, which is an old English word for tutor, is little lad leader. In other words, the one that is the schoolmaster or the tutor would prepare the child for the day. They would make certain that the child would get to the school where they need to receive instruction. They would care for that individual, little lad leader, or take by the hand to the school. Once the schoolmaster or the tutor had brought them and led them to where they needed to be, then they had done their part. The law of Moses had done its part. And when the law brought us to Christ, then, if you will, Christ takes the lead in our lives. Christ, as we note from Romans 10 and verse 4, He is the end of the law to everyone that believes. Thus, it is all Christ and nobody else. We also learn from texts such as Acts 3, 38 and 39, and the wonderful inspired composition of Paul in Romans 3, beginning with verse 20 and through 22, that the law of Moses could not justify one from sin. It was going to take Christ. Therefore, as the law brought us to Christ, our schoolmaster or our tutor, now we're no longer under the tutor or the schoolmaster, or if you will, the law. Now keep in mind, the law had its purpose. The law would make sin known. That's Romans 7, 7 through 9. Therefore, God, through the law, taught and instructed man how to live and what to do with his sin in the offering of sacrifices. But we know there was one sacrifice over and above all, and that being Jesus Christ. Let's look for a moment of the arrival of that faith, the faith of which we read. 
We want to go to the Old Testament, to the book of Jeremiah, verses 31, 31 through 34. We want to go to that text because this is a prophecy of the change of which we are speaking. You can look at your scripture or look on the screen with us. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now, this is the prophecy of what is going to come in the book of Jeremiah. Now, if you will, turn your Bibles to Hebrews, the eighth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 13. The prophecy of what we've talked about of the law bringing us to Christ. We see the prophecy now we're going to see the fulfillment. So from Acts chapter 8, verses 6 through 13, let's read as follows. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So friends, what do we have? Here is the prophecy of the new covenant, not according to old, in Jeremiah 31. And then the Hebrew writer, inspired by the same Holy Spirit, as Jeremiah was inspired to write, the Hebrew writer pens and says, this is happening. This is obsolete. It's ready to vanish away. Let's notice one other point. As Hebrews 8 verse 6 mentioned, the mediator Christ under a better covenant with better promises. Let's back up to Hebrews 7 and verse 12 and see for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. What priest is over the Christian today? That's Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews deals with him being the high priest. The priesthood is changed and the law is changed. So friends, we no longer use the Old Covenant or the Old Testament as a binding law. It has been brought, or the law brought us to Jesus Christ. That's why as we spend time in the New Testament, we see God's will for our lives. Now that does not mean the Old Testament does not continue to serve a purpose. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10 around verse 11, the example of Moses and Israel then, how they acted, we're reminded as it is used, how we, if we are rebellious, what will happen to us. And we think, of course, of the book of Romans that speaks of the things written aforetime were written for our learning, and through patience and comfort of the Scriptures we might have hope, Romans 15 and verse 4. Friends, to God be the glory that we have been brought to Christ and that we are no longer under that schoolmaster, but we are under the Master, Jesus Christ. Let's pause for a moment. A few words from our Daniel Howell. We'll be back for our Handling the Word of Truth segment. Our website is internationalgospelhour.com. That's internationalgospelhour.com. Please check it out and listen to our other broadcasts Learn more of our history, download our app, request our free newsletter, and free Bible study. Also, check out our free resources available from our fellow laborers in the gospel. Yes, friends, all for you through our website at internationalgospelhour.com. And now, friends, our Handling the Word of Truth segment. We've been spending time about the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection chapter of John chapter 20. I take us first to John 20, 30 and 31. We're going to the end because there's a point I want to bring forth, and then we are able to look at things, well, things that are written. John 20, 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. You may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. These are written. These are written, the revelation, or rather the resurrection of Jesus Christ from John 20. And friends, so far in John 20, we've seen the running souls to the tomb, the running tears of Mary at the tomb, but now... We want to look a little further at what happened later that day. Look with me at John 20, 19 and 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. That's beautiful. We see running souls, running tears. Now let's consider refreshed disciples. The disciples were together. Let's think about coming together. Many of you are viewing this broadcast because it could be you're unable to come together at church. Your health will not allow you. My mother-in-law and father-in-law, beautiful people, and they record not only this program, but a number of other programs that they can use to watch and They'll watch one daily to study if they're unable to travel and worship together. Now, their first choice is always to come together. People would rather come together than to be by themselves. There are so many one another's in Scripture, friends, and you can't one another by yourself. There have been the occasions that my wife and I were unable to travel and assemble together and we would take time to view and watch something such as this. I've got to be honest with you, friends. For me, it's not the same. I miss coming together. And when I look here at John 20, 19 and 20, let's notice some things in assembling together. In assembling, there is presence. The Lord is in the midst. Now, yes, He's among us here, yes, but assembling together, the Lord is in the midst. In assembling, there is peace. 
We come together for peace to strengthen. In assembling, there is proof. We look upon his death as Jesus had resurrected. There is proof. When we assemble to partake of the Lord's Supper each and every first day of the week as the church of Christ does because the scriptures instruct as such, we pause and we think about his death and what he has done. And in assembling, there is gladness. They were glad when they saw the Lord. In assembling, there is gladness. It's like in Matthew 17 where Peter, James, and John were on the mountain with Jesus, and then Jesus was transfigured before them, and there it was Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. I think about the words of Peter, Lord It is good for us to be here, and it's always good for us to be with the Lord. But friends, when we come off the mountain, we are in the valley. When we leave where we worship, we're going to be faced with a number of things. But we'll be prepared. May I ask you a question? Are you in a valley? Do you need Jesus Christ? Friends, if you believe in Christ as Jesus commanded in John 8, 24, if you're willing to repent of your sins as Jesus taught in Luke 13, 3 and 5 and commanded and preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 38, are you willing to confess Christ as the Son of God, as the eunuch did in Acts 8, 37, and then be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins? When you do that, you are added to the church we read of in the New Testament. You're not voted in. You're added by God. And dear friends, when you're part of that assembly, you can deal with the things in the valley when you come off the mountain. Can we help you look at this a little further? How about our home Bible study course that our Daniel Howell will tell you how you can receive it today? The International Gospel Hour offers a free Bible study course by mail. Study at home and at your pace. Please call toll-free at 1-855-IGH-6988 and leave your name, address, and just say, Home Study. You may also go to our website at internationalgospelhour.com, click on the Contact tab, and again, leave your name, address, and type, Home Study. We'll send it right away. Oh, friend, the wonders of creation, the faith through the new covenant and the resurrected Christ. All of this we can only say to God be the glory. Thanks for joining me today. And until next time, keep watching. Jesus who died for you, Jesus can save you. Did you know that he's the one son of the one God, son of the living God, Jesus can save you. Jesus all day, Jesus every day, Jesus when I go to bed, Jesus when I wake, I want to live a life so I hear him say, well done my child, enter in.